Hello, everyone. If you are joining us for the Performance Driven Academy Agency Example webinar, you are in the right place. Uh, today we're very excited to have uh, Rochester Regional Health be able to provide us a more in-depth webinar uh, topic on the evolution of their data collection. Uh, they presented a brief overview of what they've been doing around data and effective measurement on one of our previous webinars, but uh, due to some uh, suggestions and feedback from folks about how it would be helpful to hear more detail about how providers are um, doing some of the work that we discussed and we only give them a brief period of time uh, on our typical webinars. This is our follow-up to that where they're going to be given the whole hour uh, to talk to you about what they've been doing uh, and answer any questions that you might have. If, uh, can you advance the slide just one, please, RRH? Thank you. Uh, just a quick reminder, and then I'll hand over the microphone to them. This webinar, like all in this series, is brought to you by the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center, which is a partnership between the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research uh, and the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse. I am Brianna O'Connor. I am the Associate Director of CCSI Center for Collaboration and Community Health. We are the upstate partner for MCTAC, and we have been um, hosting and pulling together the PDA series for you. Um, and with that, I will uh, turn the microphone over to Mandy Teeter, who is the Director of Operational Excellence and Adult Mental Health at RRH, to uh, walk you through what they'll be uh, providing for you today. Thank you, Brandon, and uh, welcome everyone on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Um, we'll start out giving an overview of Rochester Regional Health. Um, so Rochester Regional Health is in upstate New York for folks that are in the upstate region. Um, we're, we're in the uh, Finger Lakes region, and so we'll talk a little bit about the uh, size of the Rochester Regional Behavior Health Department, just to give a, uh, some context for how large we are. Um, so really what we're going to do is an overview of the Rochester Regional Health Behavior Health Department. We're going to talk about our planning around our data um, vision, what sometimes we call our data roadmap, um, and where we started and where we're going to for that. And then we're really going to focus on one key performance metric and talk about how we started really with some grassroots data collection on one key metric and how we've continued to evolve our sophistication in understanding our performance in that metric. Um, we'll do a quick demo of some of that specific data to that metric in ClickView, and then we'll open it up for some questions. Um, part, part of this presentation will also be provided by our clinical analysts. Frankie Tangretti, as well as our Manager of Operational Excellence, Liz Schreiber. So starting out, just giving it an overview of, of the size of Rochester Regional Health, because sometimes it's helpful to have that context when we're talking about um, your data roadmap or your vision. So Rochester Regional Health is the merger of five acute care hospitals, um, one of them located in Genesee County, United Memorial Medical Center, Unity Hospital in Rochester or Monroe County, um, Rochester General Hospital, also in Monroe County, Newark Wayne in Wayne County, and Clifton Springs Hospital and Clinic out in Ontario County. And in the, this slide, you can see the array of services that we have across the entire behavior health department. In addition to our five acute care hospitals, we also have behavior health um, locations that are um, affiliated with the hospitals but aren't located right at the hospital. So we provide a, a depth of behavior health services that include both mental health services and chemical dependency services. The services are available throughout the lifespan, um, starting with kids as young as five years old and um, working with folks at the end of life as well. We have both inpatient services, emergency department services, we have ambulatory services, community-based services, um, as well as residential for substance use disorder services as well. So we're quite a large organization, and we're about three years post-merger, just to give a sense of, of who we are. A little bit more detail, just to understand the um, size of our organization, is we do have 14 behavior health locations in four counties. Um, I've talked a little bit about those. If you see the map in the upper left-hand corner, you see that's kind of generally where we are in the state. Um, we have four emergency department access points, with one of them operating a, co a comprehensive emergency program, often referred to as CPEP. We have just under 1,000 staff members. We have about 2,000 individuals enrolled in healthcare care, ma care management. We have the two chemical dependency residential programs. We have five school-based health centers in Monroe County and the city school district. 
Um, we have 75 active psychiatric inpatient beds and 92 chemical dependency inpatient beds, and we have some therapists embedded into primary care practices. And this is just a little bit more detail about the number of operating licenses we have, the number of hospitals, um, the, again, the number of beds, the, the number of inpatient discharges to focus you at the bottom of the screen that we did in 2017. That would include both our chemical dependency and our psychiatric inpatient programs. And then the total number of outpatient visits we did in 2017, that would include both our chemical dependency clinics, our mental health clinics, um, as well as our pros programming as well. So just to give an overview of the scope and size of Rochester Regional Health. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about our data planning and what we've done in just thinking about, like I said, we're three years post-merger. So at the end of 2016, early 2017, we really started thinking about when you're an organization of this size and recognizing the importance of data and maximizing the data that we have access to. Um, the importance of having a vision for our data, figuring out where all, all of our data exists. And so I'm going to turn it over to our clinical analyst, Frankie Tangretti, to talk a little bit about what we did in 2017, even to start to structure us in thinking about how we could use data within a department this large. Hi, so I'm Frankie Tangretti. I started with Rochester Regional in May of 2017, so I've been here about a year. Um, I've broke this up into a three different categories so we can look at data that we've leveraged. So these are things that we already had and maybe the behavioral health department just didn't realize that they were available or did not have access to them at the time. We have data that we've acquired. So these are actual new sources that we were able to pull together during 2017 um, either by working with different teams within Rochester Regional or even outside in some cases. And then we have data that we've analyzed. So this would obviously be data that we already had our hands on and we were able to take a look at it in a new way so that there was a better understanding um, across the behavioral health department. So a few things that I just want to point out. A few things that I do want to point out um, there were some click dashboards already created that you can see in the um, data leverage uh, column there, but they were not specific to behavioral health and there wasn't a whole lot of training directly to the behavioral health team. So we were able to pull that uh, together and get some, some of our team more involved in that. Um, under the data acquired column, something that was very interesting is our some of our CPT code reimbursements. So, and we're still actively working on that, trying to make sure that we can get a better handle on it. I know that's something that everybody is always trying to, to deal with across all of their payers and have a better understanding of. And then under the data analyzed, um, we took a look at our clinic access. So we have information. This is another data source that they're entering manually. Um, from their walk-ins or priority access appointments, different things such as that, and we were able to take those uh, manual entries and do some more analyses around that. Follow-up to hospitalization is one that's very similar. So we have some dashboards that are either in development or the specs have been already pulled together, and so we you can see some of these here. We have plans to bring these uh, to fruition, hopefully by the end of 2017. We do have, I believe our timeline uh, goes right now a little bit into Q1 of, um, or sorry, 2018, and I, it goes into Q1 of 2019. So some of the dashboards you can see, the executive summary, that one we're currently doing uh, manually so that way leadership still has the ability to see where we are as a, as a department, uh, but that one will also be set up to run automatically, as well as adding in targets and um, against our current progress, because currently we can see on a more automated level uh, versus the previous year. The operational clinic dashboard um, is a look at how our clinics are doing 
on a day-to-day -day basis. You can see some of the metrics are more um, like show rates where we see visit status, how many discharges we have, average length of stay in a few in two different ways, both the number of days from their admission date to discharge as well as the average number of visits that clients are having during their episode of care. Um, we're looking at the diagnoses for these patients so we can see what our most common are. And we're also taking a look at things like the new patients we're getting in and the unique number of patients that we're serving at any time period. This is different than our clinic access dashboard. Um, so this one is more around how our patients are getting in to see us and if it's in a timely manner. We have a few metrics listed here. Um, I know that that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of things that need to be measured as far as um, clinic access goes. But these were some of the main ones we had. The inpatient dashboard is going to be similar to the one that the rest of the hospital is using. However, we have some more behavioral health specific information in there. So you can see down in the metrics, some of these are the hospital dashboard already has the all cause readmission rate and we have the ability in our inpatient, our behavioral health inpatient dashboard, excuse me, to um, look at the specific behavioral health readmission rate. So that would be anybody who is leaving any of our psych inpatient units and going to any one of our other mental health inpatient units, as well as our chemical dependency inpatient units. And that is obviously um, controlled by our medical records as well, because we cannot get anything that's not currently in our EMR, but almost all of our, uh, all, almost all of our departments are now up there. We have a service guest one as well that we will be taking a look at. And this one is the, uh, the one I was saying is being pushed into 2019. We've just started taking a look at this. You can, um, you, you can um, kind of see this one as more, well, what we're hoping to see is uh, predictive analytics and see how our patients are, where our services are needed, and if we can use this to start looking at our demand, both at a mapping perspective as well as a uh, diagnosing perspective and try to predict where we're going to be needed next. So now we're going to talk about our key performance metrics. Yeah, and I just I wanted to take a moment to talk about when the a lot of the work that we've done around our data vision and our data dashboard um, has really happened in the last probably about 12 months. And so we wanted to be cognizant of the fact that large health systems have the ability to have a clinical analyst right in the business line um, that we're able to really draw on the resources that are available to do data dashboards. And we didn't want to lose sight of the fact that there's a lot of work that we do and continue to do um, that doesn't require that level of sophistication and um, really some grassroots way we've been able to use data even at a very um, with basic, more of a basic skill set and using more basic tools. And so as we transition into our key performance metric, we wanted to both show where we're going with our data vision but also talk about before we get there, what's some of the work that we can do and we have been doing that hasn't um, been able to really maximize the use of the data tools that we have moving forward. So the key performance metric that we identified that we'll be talking about in this webinar is follow-up to hospitalization. We really wanted to think of a metric that would apply both to folks that provide some inpatient services, some outpatient services. Um, follow-up to hospitalization is a metric that's being talked about in the behavior health community. Um, it's important to the payers. It's important to um, inequality metric. It's important to the patients that we're serving and that we're doing a really good job that we're supporting patients as they're transitioning between levels of care. And for an organization that is, again, post-merger and really focusing hard on how do we support best practices between our own levels of care and have clear processes for that, this has been an important metric for us. So if you're not familiar with the follow-up to hospitalization metric, 
What it's really about is ensuring that folks that are discharged from an inpatient unit or a psychiatric inpatient unit um, or a chemical dependency inpatient unit are attending a follow-up appointment at a behavior health setting within five days post-discharge. Um, so this is also a HEDIS measure, and they look at both the seven days post-discharge and the 30 days post-discharge. Um, so really, when you think about that metric, what you do is, as your denominator, um, you look at your total, total patients that are discharged from your inpatient unit, and, at the, and the numerator is the number of individuals that, that attended that next appointment. And so just for some clarity, when we say behavior health, we mean mental health or chemical dependency. We really rolled out this practice to both of our um, both disciplines in this. So we really started doing some focused work on the follow-up to hospitalization metric in 2015. If anyone on this call was part of the readmission collaborative um, that OMH rolled out, um, it was really focused, it started in late 2015 and really focused on what are some of the best practices to ensure that folks leave one level of care and make it to that next outpatient um, level of care. And so when we rolled it out within our hospital system, we really just took a small handful of our programs. We used one psychiatric inpatient program, one chemical dependency inpatient program. We chose two of our outpatient clinics and two of our mental health clinics. And as I mentioned before, this is just a small component. So for example, we have four psych inpatient units. We have uh, four CD inpatient units. We have, I think, six outpatient clinics on both the CD and mental health side. So this was just a, small, a smaller kind of sample population. At the time that this initiative came out, we did do a level set meeting with the participants to talk a little bit about the metrics and the goal and the overview. And it really focused on making sure the participants understood what the metric was and what our process for collecting this data was. So in 2015 and 2016, this was really about um, really going old school with paper and emails. So we did, we created a data collection sheet. Um, it was pretty basic and it looked for um, just some real basic numerator and denominator information that was emailed to a specific person um, within our department on a monthly basis and they did the math from there. And we really started to understand our performance and follow-up to hospitalization in 2015 and 16 looking at this, um, using this process that was much more um, rudimentary. As we rolled into 2017, we realized that we were really seeing some improvement in performance in some of our units and seeing some best practices. And we were able to identify um, that this was important for us, data for us to collect. And it was important for us to roll out a more standardized process across our entire department. So we opened up this follow-up the hospitalization process to all of our hospitals, all of our ambulatory programs, um, and really, went much larger with the way that we were going to collect this information and, and how we were going to move forward with, with it. What that required was multiple meetings, and we really did a lot of focus on ensuring that the meetings included folks both from an inpatient setting and an outpatient setting. Um, so just logistically getting those folks in the room and figuring out times that work for everyone to really talk about the so what of the metric. A lot of times when we're thinking about data and we're thinking about metrics, um, it's important for us to stop and, and have that so what conversation and to say, okay, I understand it's important to some stakeholders, but why does it matter to the therapist that we're working with? Why does it matter to the inpatient social worker? And really talk about it through the context of the continuity, continuity of care and the, and the care that we provide to the patients that we serve. And really that's the, the language that the folks we're working with and our staff members um, connect best to and really want to um, support best practices. So we had a number of meetings that happened um, throughout the region because we're a regional health system and really talked about what are some of the best practices to support patient care and ensure that patients are transitioning from an inpatient setting to an outpatient setting. And then we got a little more granular, granular about what are the right workflows. And the workflows can be anything from what are our expectations for folks that are being discharged from units and securing those appointments in identifying um, the timeframes in which we provide the, that follow-up to hospitalization appointment. Um, how does someone on an inpatient unit, a staff member, even access the calendars in an outpatient setting so that we can secure those appointments? And who has what roles and responsibilities? Um, so we did a lot of work around our clinical best practice before we even identified how are we gonna collect this data and do it in a way um, that can be consistently trained across the whole 
department. As we standardized across the entire department, we got maybe one step higher in our sophistication and started using Excel. Um, so for the data analysts in the room or the folks that are working on your quality and data teams, the idea of using Excel tracking sheet for something this large with this many programs, they're having a, a major cringe moment right now because that's not the best way to collect this type of data um, that's so granular and affects so many different programs. But if we think back to where we were in our data vision and where we were going, it's, it's the best thing we had at the time and we rolled it out. So I think the, the lesson learned there is, is sometimes it can feel like how do we make, how do we move the needle on some of these metrics when we don't have sophisticated tools? And as we get more sophisticated, we'll look back and, and kind of laugh on, the, on our use of Excel for this. But at the time, we knew we wanted to move the needle. We wanted to engage folks. And all we had was Excel, so we used it. Um, so we created some somewhat complicated Excel file tracking sheets that all of our programs um, and staff were trained on. And we populated it as much as possible. So in addition to having a monthly Excel tracking sheet, we created a monthly data dashboard from those Excel files. Um, the monthly data dashboard allowed us to look at our performance across all of our areas in a way that we weren't able to before in our email and paper version. Um, so you see we're kind of still in the early to middle phase of using data in a more sophisticated way, but this was part of our evolution. So this is just a, a, a snippet of the workflow that we identified. So we came up with what are our clinical best practices um, before we even got to the Excel file about what do we want this process to look like as people are transitioning from inpatient to outpatient? Who do we need to engage in the process and how do we really support the success of patients making it to that next level of care? For us, it was about the role of the inpatient social workers or discharge planners and the role of care management and really engaging care management um, at the front door um, so that we could use the leverage of the care managers to support our transition into outpatient. This is just a, a small piece of a larger workflow. You also see the, there's roles and responsibilities um, if we showed you the full workflow for our outpatient providers, including the ability within our EMR for our inpatient staff to go in and access the calendar for our outpatient clinics so that they could secure those. Um, those appointments, and, our, and we made the best practice of securing that follow-up appointment within two days of discharge so that we could really, if someone missed that appointment, we still had the opportunity to engage them um, later in the week. So this is just a quick screenshot of the Excel file that we use, um, and so it's a very manual process, but I'm just going to be transparent in sharing how manual it was and how we just got very granular. So we share this with our inpatient programs, and we ask them to track every discharge um, from their inpatient unit for the month. That was then shared with our outpatient programs, who then did the follow-up tracking for those same patients. This is a smaller version of the larger. We were looking at a number of components, but the follow-up to hospitalization was part of it. Um, whenever possible, we did attempt to set the format of the Excel file to um, so it was a drop-down versus a type-in, because you can imagine when you have um, 30 programs inputting into an Excel file, and people get creative with their input in the Excel file and putting narrative in places where you want numbers and how that becomes a bit of a data nightmare. And so that does happen when you use Excel file, but we continued and stayed the course and continued to work through this process um, because the actual metric or the care we were trying to provide supported us continuing through this process. So there's a high potential for error in this process, and there is a lot of manual inputting and updating that is required when your system this large. Um, I'm not sure the size of everyone that's on the call, but if you're smaller organizations, Excel can really be a good tool to do some of this work if, if you don't have um, lots of levels of care and lots of programs, um, because it does allow you to do some of the tracking that you want to do. Next, I know this is difficult to see, and the goal is not necessarily to show every single element of this, but to just give a sense of we then collected all of that data on a monthly basis and then showed for each of our programs the performance on various metrics. Um, this was shared in a place where all of our programs and our entire department could take a look at it every month and see the performance that we had on some of these metrics across the organization. And it really allowed us to highlight 
where we were having some successes, where we had some opportunities for improvement. Um, again, this was just a homegrown Excel um, dashboard, so it wasn't anything too sophisticated. So this, at the Q4 of 2017, um, throughout 17, because we had this dashboard, we were able to take a look at, I've already mentioned, um, our performance across each program. We had a dashboard for our inpatient settings. We had a dashboard for our outpatient settings. Um, we were using the metrics off of those monthly Excel files to populate those dashboards. We were really stopping and taking a look at where we had some best practice areas and sharing those lessons learned with some of our other programs um, so that we could support performance across the board. We continued to identify some of the process um, metrics or process improvement activities we could do at the clinical level to support better performance um, and updated workflows so that we could support the patient care. As, as we were going into 2017, our goal really at that point was to be thinking about we, we need to not continue to use this manual Excel tracking file. We really need to optimize our electronic medical record so that we can collect the key data elements that we find to be important and then have this pull right out of our EMR and share it with us in a way that's, that's really actionable data and to free people up from all of the ex manual Excel uh, tracking. The nice thing is we did have a lot of lessons learned from the manual tracking process because we were able to say which are some of the key elements we want to continue to track and which are some of those that are less important to us and um, really we need to focus on the key elements for the uh, EMR data collection. So when it came to automating this report, um, we really needed to make sure that we had all of our programs in there in, in this new report, and we needed to make sure that everybody who needed to be at the table was. So one portion that you'll see at the top there is the behavioral health programs within Rio. So that is a part of the automation that actually still is not even complete. So you'll see as I talk through this that even the automation is a multiple step process. The, uh, we use EPIC as an EMR and RIO feeds into there allowing us to see some other hospitals or other agencies uh, information about our clients. However, not all of it is available. Certain um, organizations do hide their behavioral health information from the, the this uh, it's called Care Everywhere option within Epic, and some do not. So we have to work through where we'll be able to find this information, as well as the fact that these are all new tables, even for our IT and business intelligence team to learn and have to understand. So that part will take time, but it's a very exciting thought that we'll be able to hopefully within the next few months be seeing even readmissions to other inpatient departments outside of our hospital as well as possibly the follow-up appointments that our patients are having with other organizations. So the meetings that we had, um, like I said, needed to have a, a few different members. So in order to come up with these data specs, we needed um, Care Connect experts on our team. They, we have analysts um, within our health system that are very, very specified in their training within EPIC and for good reason. They are very good at their job. But with follow-up to hospitalization, if you have somebody who is specialized in inpatient and then someone who is specialized in outpatient, they have to also be able to work together which sounds very simple, but sometimes those two systems don't talk to each other very well. So that was a conversation that we needed to have. We also talked about the frequency of this report and how it was going to be validated to be sure we were capturing everything that we absolutely needed. So as we did this, creating the specs, we had the Excel file that Mandy showed you. We had a really great place to start. Um, which made it a, a lot simpler. We did add quite a bit to it, new fields that we thought would be helpful, such as calculations that would already be built right into the file that was being run for us. 
a few things that we had were the number of days between the inpatient discharge to when their appointment was scheduled, as well as the number of days from their discharge to when the appointment was actually completed. Because as many of you know, those very often are not the same date. We also have some calculations around their a, a zero day appointment, a one to seven day appointment, and an eight to 30 day appointment. So that helped us to be taking a look at those individual metrics. We added in a few more readmission percentages. So now we can see, as we talked about um, earlier on in our inpatient dashboard specs, that we have a readmission to any type of inpatient, readmission to a mental health um, department, but those ones are for the mental health specific discharges and readmission to a CD, a chemical dependency uh, inpatient department, as well as a medical specific one, because that one does come in handy for us to, to be able to see um, how many of our patients are, are heading to the hospital for um, other reasons. We decided that for the, um, sorry, for the uh, operational report that will be used by the staff in order to be tracking our patients as they're leaving the uh, inpatient department. We'll be running this every single day and it looks 30 days back. So this helps our staff to be able to see that a patient has been discharged. They can see that they have or do not have an appointment already scheduled. Our hope is that they do as that's part of the, the discharge planning, but it happens, um, as I'm sure everyone is aware. So that helps us to be able to grab those patients. We see their name come up in a report and everybody, or anybody who's looking at it is able to see that they need um, some outreach in order to engage that patient again. During the validation of this, we were able to find some very interesting uses of our um, different pieces of EPIC as well, so that helps us to see how our staff is using um, different portions in very, sometimes different ways, and that even brought up new um, ideas for retraining. Um, not necessarily because anybody was doing something wrong, it, it was just a, a different way of uh, commenting or adding in more detail in different places that when we saw it in some areas, we thought, wow, this, this is really helpful that this person is doing this. We need to add this to our training. Um, so validation ended up being an extremely helpful uh, part of the process. When we're looking at actually bringing this data into ClickView, it, because this is a brand new process for us, we're going to initially try to make the dashboard look similar to our, how our old one looked. I, can, I do have a demo coming up. I will be showing um, how our old uh, ClickView dashboard looked from our more manual process. So we can take a look at that. Um, when putting it into ClickView with the new one, however, it will update daily and we'll be able to see not only an operational view of, of who needs to um, who needs to be reached out to, but we'll also be able to see how we're doing as, as a system. Um, so it'll give us a historical view, and that one will not be 30 days back. It will be about a year to two years. We haven't um, come up with what we would definitely want on that end, and it will give us a great historical view of how we've done, or hopefully see that as this collaborative and as all of this um, process was put into place, we'll see our outcomes increase greatly. So I'm going to switch over to show what ClickView looked like prior to um, this, this new automation. And so hopefully this will show everyone that, that we still are even evolving this. It's still not um, complete yet. So 
what you're seeing here is a summary dashboard that was used to take a look at some of the appointments that were created. And please let me know if anybody has issues with viewing this. So I'm going to run through it very quickly. Um, we can take a look at the percentage of patients and their appointments that were made within the 30 days after their discharge. You can, we've looked at how many were staying in system, how many were out of system, and then those that did not receive a follow-up. Um, obviously, we would hope that that, that would be zero. Um, some, some patients, though, they, they either don't want to have a follow-up, um, and in this case, these are currently only mental health. I can filter over to look at our chemical dependency one afterwards. You will see that that amount increases for our chemical dependency, and that can be for um, a number of reasons, um, one of which is the, the AMA population that often does not have an appointment scheduled um, as they re refused one. So when you come down to the bottom, the other pie chart we're seeing here is um, whether or not they were actually seen within the 30 days using this our manual tracking form. And just so everybody has a, a frame of reference, this is for full year 2017. That was when our manual process was being used. So the graphs up at the top are showing the appointments that were scheduled within zero to two days. So Hopefully, we're seeing that uh, since that was our goal, everybody is in that zero to two day time frame, but obviously that's not always a possibility. So of those that were not, 95% of them were in our three to seven day and so on. So you can see how these three work across the top. And then as you look at the same population down at the bottom, we then have three categories of whether or not they were actually seen during those time frames. So even if the appointment was scheduled, that doesn't mean that the patient is showing up. It could mean that they're rescheduling, canceling, um, a number of different things. So this is a larger view of that, um, that scheduling. And then we also broke that out by month so we could see some trends along the way and see um, where we did well and if there were any, uh, if there was any seasonality to this, to this. So this is our percent seen, 0 to 7 and 8 to 30. And then you will see the ones um, that were not seen as the, as the total. And this is a great way for us to, to see some trending. I mean, we wanted, we were able to see what we hoped to see is that throughout the year, this increased. We have our um, 0 to 7, our 8 to 30, and then this is our, our total. Because this population, I was only looking at those that had a 0 to 7 or an 8 to 30. So this does not include the population that had both, which is also a very important population that, that we need to take a look at. And what we saw down here was, again, exactly what we wanted to see from the beginning of the year until the end. Those that were not seen, we had a, a significant decrease. So that was a very helpful view for us. The bottom graphs from the summary page, again, this is them broken out um, by month, so we were able to take a closer look at this trending, um, see how we did throughout the year. We can see that um, this blue or bluish green portion gets bigger throughout the year, which is, which is definitely what we hope to see. Okay, so that concludes the, the click view portion. I do wanna, again, uh, mentioned that this will obviously be evolving. We do plan to make changes to this with our new automated report and some of the new information that we have will be 
adding in a lot of our new fun calculations and, and hopefully taking away a lot of staff hours from the manual side. So next we'd like to um, open it up to any questions that folks may have. And I believe that you can um, type them in or I believe type them in, raise your hand in the webinar. Yes, yeah, that's right, Mandy. Uh, Mandy and Frankie, thank you so much for all your presenting uh, and all the great ideas and information that you're sharing about how RRH has approached uh, the ever important question of data. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to chat them in to all panelists or to hosts. Uh, we have um, uh, some, plenty of time for some questions. Um, I did have a um, one that came through for you guys around, uh, you talked about some of your stakeholder groups um, that participated in the planning about what you were going to be looking at. Um, did you have um, consumers or, or recipients of services participating in those? And if so, did they provide any interesting um, insights? Yeah, so we have a patient advisory committee that um, for the department that we're able to bring certain like process improvement projects to and provide some feedback. Um, so we do take some of these bigger uh, items to that committee and they can provide feedback on what we should be thinking about um, and what will be important. Um, so part of what some of the feedback that we hear is so we're, our goal is to really engage folks in the next level of care right away. Sometimes we get feedback, and this isn't a universal statement, but sometimes the feedback is, you know, I just completed an inpatient stay. I don't want to go right back to my appointment the next day or in two days. Um, it's obviously not the feedback from everyone, but we have heard that at times, um, that folks want a little bit of time home when they're released from an inpatient unit. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, in another question that's come in, um, are you using data that are shared via the RIO for your patient analysis regarding what services are used post-discharge? So that is the hope. Um, as I said, we haven't had a chance to dig into that quite as much just yet. We have been taking a, a quick look at some of our, our readmission percentages, um, but currently one of our, our barriers is trying to figure out how to pull within um, EPIC, how to pull those out appropriately and make sure we're looking at the, the inpatient stays that, that we're hoping we're looking at. So it, it's not always easy to discern that it's a behavioral health inpatient stay or not, and sometimes um, they just come in as acute, so it's hard to tell whether that was an, an emergency visit or an actual inpatient stay, so we, we really need to dig into that detail, but that is the the hope and, and part of our next steps. And the access to some of that Rio data is really important, not just um, a lot of our services are in Monroe County, but we have a footprint both in the eastern to us, eastern and, and the western region, and those are not registered regional services. So for us to really be able to understand what other services patients are accessing in the community would be really useful data. Sure. You mentioned um, that some of your measures, it looks like you're measuring some of the follow-up, you're looking at whether it's within system or, or, without, or outside of the system. And it seems like for a large system like yours, the within system would provide you the opportunity to, um, to line up your measures with staff accountability. Um, is that anything that you guys have, have started to, to look into? Yeah, so for the manual tracking process in Excel, a lot of that was really about what the the services that we had the ability to influence, right? So the outpatient programs that we own and operate, the inpatient programs that we operate, um, our own clinical best practices. But when we look at things like HEDIS measures, we're not, we're not uh, measured or we're not demonstrating our performance only for the services we provide, and we're actually accountable to things and follow up to organizations and programs that we don't, um, that are not part of our, our service system. So what can get a little bit complicated sometimes is we have lots of different ways and different data sets to look at one similar metric. So for example, follow-up to hospitalization is a perfect example of that. We have our internal today, and we're moving into a more automated system where we can look and get the data specific to Rochester Regional Health. Um, our payers have um, our total patient follow-up 
to any provider in the community that we may be partnering with for continu continuity of care. For GRIPA, which is our um, ACL that's associated with Rochester Regional Health, we can look at our performance for patients that we treat who have a primary care physician within, within our um, Rochester Regional Health Organization. So when you look at those different um, metrics, still the same metric, same numerator and denominator, but the population's slightly different, and you're going to see variations there. So we do do a lot of that, trying to get to here are the things we can influence, but recognizing that we're accountable for things that, for programs that we don't um, own and operate. Great, thank you. There's a couple other questions coming in if you're still um, able to take them. So uh, earlier on in the presentation, you mentioned um, that you kind of parsed out and had different dashboards for different audiences. Can you talk about what were some of the reasons or purposes for having those separate dashboards? So I'll, I'll start it and then Frankie will, will finish. But the, just the sheer magnitude of what is our data vision and what's our priority for data that it can be actionable that we need to have in front of us right away. Um, to start from just understanding what data resources we had about what data sources we had available to us to charting out well what are the key dashboards was a feat in and of itself um, and that can be overwhelming to be thinking about we have potentially hypothetically data all over the place but how do you take those data sources and then identify the key metrics that you want for them and then it's easy to say what a metric is, but what do we really mean when we're saying what's in the numerator and denominator for that? And that is quite a feat. So there, there's a portion of it which is just you have a big vision, what are your priorities, and how do you start to chunk it out? But I'll also let Frankie add to that as well. Yeah, so I think that one really good example probably of what was seen above was like the operational and the clinic access. That, um, that those two different dashboards. Right now they, they say that they're broken out, but that's because we really, really need to spend a lot of time focusing on those individually. And like Mandy said, that made it more manageable for us to, to wrap our heads around what we needed for them. Um, that's not to say in any way that in the future those wouldn't be a part of the same dashboard should that start to make sense. And I, I see that it's very possible it would. I think the same people would probably be looking at it and eventually the questions would start to overlap such as okay for for these patients that have this kind of access you know what what happens and and I think that then we would definitely want that put together and to that point between even the inpatient dashboard and the outpatient dashboard I mean uh, from what I just showed I think you could see that there were different tabs within click you don't have to look at everything um, all on the same page at the same time so it might be interesting at some point to have a behavioral health inpatient dashboard that has a view or a couple of views of what we need to see for inpatient. Then you see our follow-up to hospitalization information on another tab, and it brings you right into our outpatient tab because they really do all flow together then. So at some point, if they all come together and they, all of the data sources can talk to each other, just as nicely as we would hope them to be able to, then I think that would make a lot of sense and would be um, definitely a lot easier for everybody to keep track of as well. And I see people using it more often rather than having to click back and forth into different things and go find different reports. So I don't think that because they're broken out in our uh, roadmap, that means that they will always be broken out. And this is just for the, the ability of creating them and making sure we have the access to the data and we're analyzing the appropriate things. And then there are definite next steps that might change that in the future. Great. I think just one last question that I can see. If anyone else has any, uh, please feel free to um, chat them in. I. So uh, you talked a little bit about this in a couple different ways, but um, just it's always an issue that folks bring up, um, which is uh, how did you get buy-in from your clinicians as well as other members of the different divisions um, to use the dashboards and provide the data? Folks always, um, we hear that in a lot of places as well, but people have difficulty getting their staff to really want to look at the data and how they're performing. So how did you approach getting buy-in from your clinicians and other staff? Yeah, there's there's lots of layers to that. So the um, the first layer is 
kind of going back to the so what of it all, um, to make sure that if we are, I, whether it's a data dashboard, which is probably like the highest level down to, we need to identify better processes for a specific metric, that when we're doing that work, that we're clearly articulating the so what, and we're doing it in a way that makes sense to um, the different types of staff members and the different roles that we have here, and then really get, getting the feedback from them on they're the ones that are in the best position to speak to, what's the right workflow, what's the right process, um, all of that information. So that's part of it. I think at the more granular level is having that conversation, soliciting their feedback, making sure we're asking the right questions. Um, then when we get to what are the right, so when a metric is given to us from um, a payer, from DISRIP, from something else, that's one way to handle it. When we're defining what are the key metrics for our organization, that's where we have taken a lot of time to really develop that skill set, or sometimes we say, like, let's strengthen that muscle around even identifying metrics. So something like access seems really simple, right? So access is important to all of us, and what does access mean? That patients can access the services they want when they want to. Okay, what are the important metrics? And then that's where it gets a little, well, how long does it take for someone to get in? Okay, what's the starting point? And we had a number of, of meetings that sometimes can feel a little bit, um, sometimes you want to pull your hair out. I'm going to be honest here because I think we've got some people on the webinar that have sat through those meetings and said, we know we want to measure the right things, but you need to get the right people in the room to define the right things. And that's not something a data analyst can do alone, and that's not something that a clinician can do without a data analyst. So you bring the right people in the room and you just start talking through um, what, what would, if you could have the right data sets and where does it start and where does it end and by which population, why does that matter, would we change our clinical care and it's a lot of um, structured meetings and really staying the course. Um, I, we do not have the experience as much I would say that people don't want to see the data. I think what's really important is involving the right people in the identification of the data and the data specifications because there's nothing worse than doing all the work on a data dashboard, putting it in front of your stakeholders, or your, whether it be the leaders, the managers, the clinicians, and them saying, well, that's not accurate because you pulled the wrong source or you didn't know the right place to look for that. That feels like a waste of everyone's time and it doesn't feel good when you finally get there and it's wrong. So engaging the right people from the beginning, having some champions of change, um, really doing tight validation, engaging the right people to really validate um, and looking for those people that want to build those muscles. And the people that don't, they'll come along too. <laughs> and I think the other thing that's um, important to know, I, I joke with Mandy a lot actually about the fact that um, I am an, an, an analyst embedded in the business line, um, but I, my title could be translator. So <laughs> there are challenges to having people that the people that Mandy talked about all in the same room together, it's not always easy. Your IT team does not speak the same language that your therapists do a lot of the time. And that's not through any fault on anyone's side other than the fact that they just, they see things very differently. So if you have somebody in your organization that's able to understand the way that the IT team these things or your business intelligence, however, um, whichever uh, they're called at your agency, and they can also be able to talk to your therapist. They don't need to have the degree on either side necessarily, just the ability to understand each other, and that, that makes it extremely helpful. Well, I see that we are at 1 o'clock, and I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, your contact information is up on the slide for everyone uh, if they do have follow-ups, which was one of the questions, too. Uh, I think this has been a really valuable look at how uh, a large system uh, can really think about data, but also that it really requires small basic steps like that everybody needs to um, think about and think through. So I think it's really, really helpful, hopefully, to other agencies to see how someone else does it and thinks about it so they can take um, what's meaningful back to their agency and, and move along their own measurement processes. If you could advance the slide just one, I have one last um, 
slide, just reminding folks about the next event in our Performance Driven Academy series is this coming Wednesday, uh, May 23rd from 12 to 1. This will be practice development and management where we'll actually be rolling out uh, the Excel-based dashboard tool uh, for folks that really provides those automatic uh, visualizations and filters uh, to be able to look at outcomes by different um, slices. Nothing quite as fancy as what um, Frankie and Mandy presented today, but uh, hopefully a good start for some folks. And then we do have our in-person events in late June. Um, the dates have been set for Rochester, Albany, New York City, so please register individually by person, not just by agency. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you and hearing you on both of those events. Thank you all for your time today, and again, a uh, very sincere thank you to the RRH team for sharing their process. Thanks for having me. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.